so let's start. Uh, so the opening question is, um, is really very open-ended. Um, I want everybody to just tell us um, what your organization does, and, and, and in a sense, a little bit on a philosophical level, what that suggests about your view on the role of philanthropy in the, in the social sector. Like, is it an innovation tool? Is it a scaling tool? Is it both? Does it just depend? Um, and how do you think about short run, long run trade-offs for the philanthropic sector between solving immediate problems, dealing with infrastructure problems for the long run? Where does your organization fit in that, in that spectrum? Great, so I'm happy to kick off. Thanks, Dean. Um, so first, you know, when you think about the problem, the scope is actually of international development and the needs. We are trillions of dollars short of what's needed to achieve these sustainable development goals. You have billions of people who are living below the poverty line. And so you could look at that and actually be extremely daunted, or you could channel some of Richard's energy and say, this is actually a challenge that we can meet. We just need to get really creative about how we leverage philanthropic dollars and how we leverage our own efforts. And that's what Evidence Action does. So we seek different ways to be catalytic in our actions. How do we do that? Well, first, um, if you look at it, the scope of giving for governments is much greater than within the philanthropic sector. So one of the things that we try to do is to actually think about how we can scale up the most cost-effective programs. So Dean mentioned deworming. Excuse me. Dean mentioned deworming. Deworming is incredibly cost effective. It costs 50 cents per child to treat someone and it has lifelong benefits. And so what we do is we scale that program. I'm sorry, why don't you go and sit next? Do you want uh, yeah. some water? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can we maybe get some water? Yeah. Ah. Go ahead. So okay. Come back, Come back Nikki. Um, so maybe I can just pick up. Uh, so NPC, New Philanthropy Capital, is um, an organization that was started by a group of Goldman Sachs partners back in 2001, uh, who were data-driven investors. And they figured that they would do that in their philanthropy life, and they couldn't because there wasn't any data out there that was being provided back in, uh, back in 2001. So we were set up as a, as a non-profit ourselves to, uh, to help philanthropists to find what's effective and you know, very much a, a parallel organization, a sister organization to Founders Pledge in, in many ways, but also to look under the hood of why isn't there any data here? Why aren't we making evidence-based decisions? Uh, and so over the last 15 years, we've been working on uh, being a broker between donors and the evidence base and making it easy for donors to find effective charities, but also trying to work out how do we shift the incentives and how do we shift the behaviors? Because uh, I don't think it's all just about having the right frameworks to measure and, and the right approaches, that, but actually there are people and egos and money and power involved in why we're not using evidence, and maybe we'll come back to that. Great. Sorry about that. So in any case, what I was saying was with which deworming, the impact has been enormous. We've actually seen that when you treat a child, it results in better educational outcomes. Actually, education, uh, the reduction in absenteeism is 25%. Lifelong income improves up to 23%. In fact, in the US, these differences between the American South and the American North historically smoothed once you actually got these deworming treatments out there. So our focus has been on how do you get this enormously effective intervention scaled and working with governments, which are actually the majority funder of this program, we've been able to reach 275 million people, children globally, and that's enormously leveraged. We spend 14 million euros of philanthropic capital per year to reach 275 million children and to change the trajectory of their lives. So that's one way we're catalytic. The second way we're catalytic is just really trying and seeking to scale um, high risk early stage work, much like many of you do. So what we found is that when you do programs which are higher risk, when you can get philanthropic capital to do this, because this is very hard to get funded. I think many of you are probably better suited to this than traditional philanthropists. It ends up having an enormous difference. So what we, to give you a sense, there's a program in Bangladesh where what we find is when you, um, during the, after the harvest, there's a period called the lean season where many people don't have enough food. Uh, families drop down to two meals per day and much of it is actually rice. 
And so there was a Bangladeshi economist who said, at Yale now, who said, you know, how do we address that problem? There had been all sorts of development solutions. They were clunky. They would, um, what they would do was actually, you know, try to bring jobs to these rural settings, and it didn't work. And so he said, what if we actually bring the rural laborers to the cities? He gave them $20 to come to the cities, and what they found is that that venture actually increased the caloric intake of people 700 calories per person per day at the home during that entire season. Five times more effective than just giving that as cash. But that was risky. That was, we didn't know if that, was work, that would work. That was one small study. So we had to find a philanthropist who was willing to come along with us on the journey and say, does this actually scale? It's now a give well top charity. It's considered one of the most cost effective charities out there. We're still continuing to test it and say, does this hold at scale? But we needed that philanthropist to come along with us and say, we will work with you to try and scale an exceptional venture because we believe that just as you would do high risk, high return work in the, um, in the private sector, it's worth doing in the philanthropic sector. So that's our view and that's the journey we hope many of you will come along with, with us on. Thank you. Um, just a, a brief background. So I actually live and work in Zimbabwe where I spend most of my time actually training community grandmothers to deliver um, evidence-based uh, training packages for mental, neurological, and substance use um, disorders. Uh, as, you, as you heard, there are only 12 psychiatrists in Zimbabwe. So if some of you are thinking of training psychiatrists, the response is no. <laughs> the solution is to use non-professionals, because if we're thinking of impact, non-professionals are likely um, to reduce that treatment gap. Anyway, I could spend the whole day talking about the Friendship Bench, which is a program I started, but you know, to cut a long story short, um, we've taken this package and, um, develop and used it to develop um, a digital platform, which we are hoping to actually scale up. So my starting remarks really are, when you think of what's out there, you have to look at, ask yourself two critical questions. Is the innovation evidence-based and can it be scaled up? I'll end there for now. Okay, next question. Um, next question is, so we all like the idea of evidence. Seems obvious, I mean, I just gave a whole talk, so blah, 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 <laughs> evidence. Who doesn't, right? I mean, it, it seems, you know, in a sense, when you say it, it seems kind of almost obvious but yet it's not the case that it's always there. So where, where are the objections? Who, who where is the challenge in doing what you do or what's wrong with the sector and why is this, why is this an uphill battle? Who, wants, who is it out there that's going, no, 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 I don't want evidence? Well, maybe I can kick off on that, Dean, as uh, I've spent the last 15 years kind of wrestling with those questions because yeah, of course, you want evidence, right? Um, so I think some of it comes back to the overhead problem that you mentioned uh, and the number of kind of friends and acquaintances I've lost over dinner parties by saying, look, it's not smart to minimize the amount you spend on running an organization. Uh, it's not smart. And yet that's what we do systematically. That's what we do. So we're actually saying don't invest in uh, research and evidence and don't invest in the capacity to use data. So we, we did a, a program of work working with nonprofits in England and Scotland a number of years ago, and we were asking them to develop something that I think all of you will find incredibly obvious and simple, which is their own management information system that they would use to make decisions about, is this working today, what can we improve tomorrow, what can we tweak? Um, and these organizations just weren't kind of well placed to do this because they were so institutionalized by the only data that they would collect is for the people giving them the money. That's why they're collecting data. And none of those donors were saying, yeah, well, we, we need some information, but actually it's important that you have information that you're using. Uh, and maybe even when we do our due diligence, the, the bit that was referred to as the boring but important bit by Richard earlier, um, we'll check that you actually have a management information continuous improvement kind of capacity in your organization. But that's just not there in most organizations because we're only collecting data so that we can report back. 
and, and I think that's systematic across the field. It's hard to raise the kind of money that you can invest in organizations to do that. So the smartest donors for us, uh, they, they have an investment mindset. They back organizations entirely. If you're a venture capitalist and you're supporting an organization or an angel investor, you're there for the organization to succeed and to have every resource that it needs to succeed. But actually, I think systematically, we keep charities weak. So, so then I think the challenge is, yes, we can come along and do evaluations, and it's fantastic, the work of um, uh, innovations in poverty action and evidence action, absolutely essential. But there's too little of it to go around. And I think we, we need a bit of a mindset. We need <coughs> investors who are coming into philanthropy to say, well, this isn't good enough. I expect all of the organizations that I'm talking to uh, to, to have these, these kind of capacities. Uh, and I think ultimately, we have a problem with accountability. So if I buy a product, I give uh, a signal back to that company that I value the product at that price for me. Um, but without that feedback loop with the ultimate end user, customer, or beneficiary, we only have this accountability loop to donors. So I think some of the most exciting work in the world of philanthropy is around feedback, and is around taking concepts like net promoter score, and just saying, hey, we should do that all the time, alongside the evidence. And then we've got something to work with. Yeah, I would build on that. I think that a lot of donors will say we want results but what they fund are the inputs. And so really changing that mindset. I'll give you just an example from our work. We have a program called Dispensers for Safe Water. Um, dirty water is one of the leading killers of children. Diarrhea is the second largest killer of children globally. And there's a very simple solution. If you put a few drops of chlorine in the water, it makes it safe for families, for children to drink. The challenge has been how do you get families to adopt it? You know, you have to go and, even if it's socially marketed, you have to go and like traditionally buy it from the store, like at home, remember to put a few drops in. So the innovation, which actually came through IPA, was that you put a chlorine dispenser alongside the watering source so that when you go to get the water, you turn the spigot, a couple of chlorine drops come out, you go get the water. That was actually five times, as, it had five times as high adoption as selling it in the store. Not surprisingly, I think about my iPhone, and I know if I, I have, I cannot tell you how many pictures of my five-year-old and videos, had I had a carry around a video, you know, uh, video camera like my dad, I would not have had nearly as many. So that convenience, that just, it's right there, makes such a huge difference. So that was a process innovation, which donors liked. It didn't actually get a lot of funding, frankly, but it was, they liked it. The second innovation was really much more ongoing process innovation. I call it sort of the Walmart model. We kept innovating to make it cheaper and cheaper. We moved from metal parts to plastic, which is more durable. We moved from cars transporting the chlorine to, to motorcycles. You know, altogether, probably dropped the price with that and other things, maybe 50%. That actually has created a problem with some of our donors because now the ratio of our program costs to our finance costs, the cost of managing an operation, are actually too high. <laughs> And so I think my plea to, to the philanthropic sector is to actually be clear-eyed in the outcome you're seeking. If it is live save through clean water, then reward that rather than that input. So I think there are these very simple examples of perverse uh, incentives. And I think um, Dean actually had that Apple example, but taking it back, I mean, I can't imagine an investor going to Apple and saying, you're spending too much on marketing. Your stores are a little fancier than they need to be. And so I think similarly, we have to allow the freedom for, for charities to really innovate. Um, I, I think that evidence comes in different levels. So a policymaker looks for something different. A researcher is focusing on something else. Communities look for different things as well. But from my experience, I think that um, the key thing is you know, that evidence which really um, empowers the community, um, where there's evidence of capacity building, and um, where you can actually, at the end of the day, uh, clearly indicate what change has occurred at community level. Uh, I believe these, these are the, the most sort of tangible results that we could be uh, looking at. Um, I also think from my experience that, uh, um, you know, evidence, again, depends 
who brings that evidence when you have a plane load of Harvard graduates coming in to you know, show a kind of evidence where the locals are excluded, again, whose evidence is it? Uh, and what, what value is that evidence? When you have publications where uh, local folks are not even listed on, on, the, on the paper that's published, you know, whose evidence is that? You know, who's actually benefiting? And I think as philanthropists, it becomes very important when we look at evidence to also make sure that that evidence is um, is empowering local communities, that evidence is really uh, used to build capacity. Yeah. So that's actually a perfect segue to the next question, which um, the, the jargon word is dependency. Um, and to, um, I will explain kind of two levels at which we mean this, and to ask what your, your organization's philosophy is on, on this. And, and, and how you use evidence to think about this. So the two levels where we talk about dependency, one is kind of think about it at the institutional level, which I think is kind of the context in which Dixon was just discussing. The other level is at the household level, um, which is kind of like the bed net example I was using earlier. So at the institutional level, what we mean is, um, what, is um, what is being done in your organization or in your philosophy of what should be done? It doesn't have to be necessarily your organization, but in your philosophy of how the philanthropic sector should work. Um, to empower local institutions to be gathering their own evidence and to be part of that process so that decisions that are made are kind of persisting in the long run and become part of the system and not always just part of this kind of people who fly in and kind of do things. So that's the institutional level. Um, the household level ways you can think about dependency is very, um, in a very simplistic way, it goes back to the bed net question. Should you give it away or sell it? Right? And so there's always fears when you give things away that you create dependency on aid at the household level in terms of, a, in terms of habits and expectations. Um, you know, but of course, we'd all love a world in which the markets can work to solve problems, but they don't always work. That's the reality as an economist. We realize we love markets. We think they work, but we also recognize they don't. So how do you, how do you figure out when, um, when there is a dependency issue for a program that is too, too much things for free and we should be using the for-profit sector instead? to try to address that problem. So those are the two questions. You can go either way or both. Um, let's go the other way around this time, particularly since it was, it's actually a nice follow-up to what Dixon was just talking about. Um, thanks. Um, so at institutional level, again, I'd just like to um, reiterate what I said earlier on. I think it's, uh, it's, it should be really about empowering um, local thought leaders. Uh, if we do not empower uh, the, th the local leadership, sustainability becomes very questionable. And uh, I think, you know, in, the, in, the, in academia, publications are critical. It's, they're very important. And often um, the authorship in terms of where you are within a manuscript is very important. Uh, these things might not be so important. I think as philanthropists, these are some of the things you could, you could probably demand. We want to see um, local thought leaders, academics, um, as first authors or last authors, because it means that, you know, there's first author is essentially the person doing most of the work. The, the last author is a person who has given sort of over, overview and, uh, and, and support of the work. So, so these, these things become important because the next time that group try to apply for a grant and no one is listed as a first author, the chances of getting the grant are kind of pretty dismal. You know, so all these things become pretty important for philanthropists to, it, I always say to people, you know, when they ask me what they should look for when they give money, well, try and figure out how many local people have actually been um, empowered through publications, because that's big in the world of academia. Uh, it's big in the world of, of getting grants. Um, so that's one, one thing. And then also just the general idea of, uh, of empowering um, local, local leaders. There's this misconception that um, we still don't have uh, expert 
experts or the expertise in, uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa uh, to do a lot of the research that's going on. Actually, there are people who can do that research, but they're just not given that opportunity to do that research. And I think we really need to start taking those risks because by truly empowering locals, you're going to get a lot more out of out of your uh, out of out of your out of your donations. Yeah. There are so many layers to this. Um, uh, just so many layers. I guess you know, from a very practical perspective, the work of our organisation, we we work with nonprofits, with charities, to help them evaluate their programmes, for sure. But actually, we like to rather than being the evaluator, we like to to be working with them to strengthen their capacity to gather data that they can use. And actually, I think those two perspectives uh, strengthen each other. So an evaluator who doesn't have an understanding of how data is going to be used isn't as grounded. Um, you know, they, they kind of work together. So I think it, you know, all of these things are, are not binary for me. So the work I'm most excited about assumes that um, most of the solutions, or we, sh we should start from the position that people, prob people and communities probably have most of the solutions uh, there within themselves. And it's our job to uh, unleash and coach and empower. But there are, for sure, structural problems that mean that can't always be the case. You know, it's all very well saying, well, here's a coaching program and now your life's fixed if actually the problems are about, you know, structural poverty or a lack of opportunity or whatever. Um, so, again, I think we need both. And then from a donor perspective, I think it's very easy for philanthropy to make uh, the nonprofit sector hugely dependent and people talk about the the heroin of grants um, often the folk that I talk to in the and work with in the tech for good world um, talk about this in very very stark terms that if you get addicted to grants and donations um, then you're unable actually to kind of to, to grow and, and scale your organization but I again I think it's it's about a mix but I think the um, the most progressive smart donors will think about how their money can last as long as possible within the system and how they can invest in in things that are closer to infrastructure that organizations can build on rather than a grant that they will need next year and next year and next year and that can look like lots of different things i'm not just talking about hard infrastructure but maybe it's communities of practice all of the things that i think are exciting for philanthropy by the way are almost entirely unsexy and, and boring but you know communities of practice if, if you're building mental health interventions, are those practitioners talking to each other and can they learn from each other and can then they use the evidence that's out there? I think that's the exciting stuff, but, um, but maybe that's my version of exciting. Yeah, I, I agree. There's so many nuances to this question and I don't think we have a neat answer. One of the ways we try to think about institution building um, is through our partnership with, with local governments. And so to give you an example, um, I spoke about deworming. One of the biggest drivers of, of deworming of the, you know, I think 270 million of the kids we reach are actually in India, which is not surprising given the massive population in India. But the National Deworming Day that we do there is actually entirely through the Indian government. You won't see evidence actions name on anything because we want the government to be owning this. And they do. And as a result of the fact that they see it as their own day, it's the Indian government that's implementing it. They're actually funding the majority of it. It's how we're able to be catalytic. We ask ourselves all the time at what point we would draw from any of the 11 states that we're in. And I don't have a neat answer for you. I think a lot of people want there to be a neat answer. But you know, my view is if we have four people in a, in a state in India, which is reaching you know, uh, 10 million children, is that the right number if we take it down to two? So we're, so we're really, you know, a lot of donors ask us, when are you going to exit? And for us, it's always a balance of thinking about when, you know, how are we building the institutions? Are we pushing ourselves to build the institutions? But are we still achieving the outcomes that we want? There's no neat answer. I think what you look for is an organization that's pushing itself to ask those questions and thinking, being really thoughtful about how they are working with, with institutions on the ground and people on the ground. OK, thanks. The last question is a softball, but in a sense. But um, what is your short, pithy, one paragrapher that you want to leave everybody with? So you know, when they reflect back on what you said in five years, what do you want, to be what do you want them to remember you for saying? 
let's start with Kanaka. <laughs> or you can you, go in any order you want. If you don't want to go first, that's fine. No, that's fine. Okay. Um, I actually had it prepared for this question. So I would say, um, <laughs> Be transformational. I mean, take the same approaches that you're using in your day-to-day -day business. Be entrepreneurial, be risk-taking, look for those high leverage opportunities, um, and also bring your own skill sets. I mean, I we would love to partner with um, groups and experts who are thinking about how do you do better human-centered design? How do we make more human-centric programs? How do we reach that last mile? So, so many of you bring the tools and expertise that are incredibly valuable. So I think be strategic in your giving, take the same principles of investing in really high caliber people, and then take risks. Don't sort of seek to micromanage, but instead you know, just do exactly what you're doing in, in your day-to-day -day lives. Uh, what you said. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing how many times you, you see philanthropists take off their, their mind and just park that from their day job and then just go and, and be like, oh, yeah, this looks lovely. Um, so, you know, be, uh, you know, you're all skeptical guys. You, you test everything ruthlessly. You expect it to fail and pivot and learn and all of that stuff. And then in philanthropy, we're like, oh, can I have a magic bullet, please? And then uh, show me this evidence and I'll do it forever and it'll be perfect. It's like, you wouldn't do that in your businesses. So, so bring those kind of smarts to bear. Um, and I think at the same time, I think the most inspiring donors to me are the ones who also bring humility to the table and say, you know, I want to do this really well, but I'm going to learn and I don't know yet. And over time, you see them become experts and they become more and more strategic and they become more and more part of the field and appear um, with those they're supporting. Um, so that, that kind of the skeptical uh, but humble philanthropist is, uh, is a powerful combo. Yeah, just three short messages. Um, is it evidence-based? Does it empower local communities? Um, can it be scaled up? That's all for me. Great. Okay, so Yeva, you have yes. for it with, question, with questions now. Do you want me to sit now for this part? Okay. Okay. So Dean, I would actually like to start with a question for you. You've recently wrote an article in Stanford Social Innovation Review about when not to measure the evidence and what to do instead. Would you like to talk a little bit more about that? Sure. I want to, I want to clarify. It was when not to measure impact. Yes. Key difference. Because um, one of the first points is um, we have, uh, let's see if I can remember my piece now. Um, not the right question. Uh, two, two, oh shoot. No, it was said more eloquently. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, what was it? It's too fast. Oh, I had four things. It was so much pithier. But basically, uh, here's the point. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that there's a lot of situations. You know, we, as you know, you know, I put up some slides, showed you like, you know, 500, 600 randomized trials measuring impact. But there's a lot of situations where we turn away, so we turn away opportunities because they're not really a good opportunity. It's not a, it's not a good setting. Maybe the organization hasn't figured out what they're going to do. That's the too early. They're still tinkering. They still don't know what they're doing. So don't do a randomized trial. There might be evidence that you need to gather at that point, but it's not a randomized trial. It's getting feedback. Um, it's talking to the constituents who are doing something, getting, finding out are they using it, things of this nature. And then, it's, and then at some point it's setting the stage for when you can do a randomized trial. Um, it might be that, the, that it's just not feasible. That's, okay, so there's too early, there's too feasible. I mean, not, not feasible, not the right timing. So not feasible is, you know, maybe this is a program that is doing something at a country level. You can't randomize across countries, right? And that's just the nature of the beast. That doesn't mean don't do it, right? Maybe, the, maybe it's a legal, re, legal reform institution. Um, the, the prison project I heard about, you know, we just heard about earlier. What are you going to do, randomize which prisoners you're working with? To, that are to, no, I don't think that's probably viable in your context. Maybe it is, and I'm being simplistic, but, uh, you know, my hunch is that there's going to be a lot of things out there that it's just not, not viable. Um, but that doesn't mean don't use evidence, but it does mean use evidence to ask other questions. Don't just be sloppy about calling something impact that's not. And that's one of the main messages, is when you can't answer the impact question, it doesn't mean throw away the idea of collecting evidence, but it does mean throw away the idea of measuring impact. It's okay. And talk about what you did. Did you do what you said you would do? Are you getting feedback? There's other useful things to be collecting. But let's not misrepresent data as measuring impact when it's not. 
and let's not collect crappy impact data. Um, and does anyone else have something to add in terms of good practices of when, especially smaller charities, are not measuring give backs? What else can they do? Well, I think using the existing evidence is, is something that I'm sure we would all support and, and doesn't happen nearly enough. Uh, we often find um, that both the organization themselves and the donors that are supporting them are kind of operating like this. this is an entirely new thing. And I think that's a little bit like the we have a real special snowflake problem in, in our sector that donors kind of want to feel unique and special and they ask the organizations to make them feel like that by saying, you're unique and special, tell me how, we're all unique and special. It's like, honestly, a lot of organizations are doing exactly the same thing and some of them are doing better um, and we should celebrate that, but then we can also learn together. So I think a lot of the time that that infrastructure for learning, the journals, the communities of practice, or even donors having a little bit of a think and research or ringing out one of these guys and saying, do we know anything here? Before we start, that will be helpful. So we actually have another question relating to this. A lot of impact, all impact evaluations are done in specific contexts. How often does it actually translate into another context? Uh, well, I'll, I'll jump in by just saying you find that out by testing it in the other context and by having a theory as to why it works that can guide you as to whether the context is applicable. Because it's sometimes the case that you might want to test in the other context. But it might be a case that if you have a good theory as to why it's working and you do have strong evidence to support that theory, then, then you're good to go. And, and I say theory in a very hand-waving way, and I realize the devil's in the details on that. But that's the basic idea, you know. Yeah, and I think we're, we're trying to figure this out as evidence action to, to figure out what we think might be more sort of turnkey solutions. And so, you know, if you think of something like uh, so we're actually in the very early stages of looking at intervention around treating um, syphilis in pregnant women. It turns out that if women have syphilis in their pregnancy, uh, it actually leads to really quite terrible outcomes. There's hundreds of thousands of preterm and early deaths. Um, and it testing, you know, there's, there's actually rapid diagnostics tests that will give women results in uh, minutes it takes a single dose of antibiotic to treat, uh, and it's highly effective. We think most of the women uh, in the settings where this is prevalent are actually already interacting with the health system through antenatal clinics. My hypothesis, this is super early stage, is, but is that that would be probably a pretty generalizable intervention. We're also looking at stuff around, you know, how do you create incentives to avert child marriage? That's inherently something that we suspect may be quite different, just different rates of child marriage, but also different sort of cultural norms, et cetera. So I think there is, you know, to, to Dean's point, you, you have to test it in different settings. I think you can have some hypotheses of, of what's more generalizable and less. On that point, though, I wouldn't say just because something's not super generalizable is, doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. So I think that's also the trade off in terms of how are you thinking about scale versus just some doing some things that could be really impactful in certain settings. Would you also agree, though, that it's about um, sometimes breaking down the components of a program that are actually operating and that those components are very translatable? So, you know, do you have the appropriate level of training in the, in the staff or practitioners who are providing an intervention? Are you doing your customer service well? Are you, are you understanding who you're trying to reach and reaching them well? Or, um, one of the areas we're, we're learning about is the um, use of peer support, so where people are actually supporting each other in various ways in different kinds of programs that actually there may be common learnings that come out of that kind of set of interventions, particularly around technology. There are great ways to do that and there are times when peer support is terrible. So if you have two people with mental health issues who are in crisis, them supporting each other at that moment of crisis is a bad idea and that's a very translatable kind of component. One of the examples I sometimes use is actually on deworming on this. Um, it's going to sound really stupid, what I'm about to say, but it hopefully makes the point. Is, um, you know, we have a problem. Children aren't going to school. So it's tested in Kenya. Well, with, maybe they're sick, and so we give them deworming pills, and they get healthier, and then they go to school. And that's basically what was found. So, so this is great. Is this generalized in that way? Should we just go wherever we have children not going to school at the rate that they should and give them deworming pills? Because it's probably, I'm probably sure that we can go to some areas of London and see truancy problems. Does this mean we should pass out deworming pills in inner city London? No. Right? What's, this, what's, what's missing there? It's a theory as to why it worked. The theory had to do with 
intest having intestinal worms. It's not rocket science theory, but that's the theory of change. So you have to state what that theory of change is and ask whether these components are there to make this theory work in that new context. And in that case, that would immediately tell you, don't use this as a solution to truancy problems in London. Maybe we should turn to Dixon instead, and maybe there's some cognitive behavioral therapy and substance abuse, and maybe that's the theory of change that would actually work to deal with the, the London issue with truancy. And so that's, it's a question of understanding what's your theory and how's that working. And, and if we um, identify that properly, then that's what exactly guides you to say what evidence can be carried elsewhere. Just, can I just add on to, to that? Um, just a word of caution. There's, um, there's a difference between testing and implementation because often when we test an innovation, it's not, we don't use the real world setting. You know, we use, you know, as I indicated earlier on, often we're using university graduates, you know, PhD, doctorate students. But when you take it into the real world, most of those, most of those experts or expertise are not there. So again, um, when we think of, uh, of implementation, uh, the ball game is quite different. You know, there might be a whole lot of different factors that need to be taken into consideration. We have a couple of questions about relationship between charity and government. Um, Richard talked today about uh, one of the big goals for philanthropy being finding uh, testing solutions and finding solutions that governments can implement at scale. And one, one part of the question is why doesn't it happen more? And another part of the question is does it make governments less accountable? So why we don't see more testing? Um, this is a question. So we're, we're building an incubator. We have an incubator within Evidence Action. And we actually find it remarkably difficult to find funding for this, not only from governments, but even from fairly business-minded foundations. And, and the reason we've been given is that it's really hard. You know, We'll have leaders of these foundations say, it's really hard for us to go to our board and say, you invested a million dollars in these three interventions and we have nothing to show for it in terms of impact, right? And so, and for governments, that's incredibly difficult. So we're, we're actually finding, and we're, we're still figuring that as we go, but that there is gonna most likely be a niche of, of high risk sort of angel investor equivalents in the space that we're hoping to cultivate. But I think the reason why is just that it's the, the philanthropic sector has not been oriented in that way. That's I think the first reason. The second is that you know, this couples with sort of this results revolution idea. Now that we can actually measure the results, I think it's a lot easier to say, okay, we, we can actually be seeking these sort of blockbuster programs as based on the results, the evidence of impact, the scale. Uh, and when you, in the absence of that, it is very hard to say, you know, let's pick this program over that program. So I, I'm not sure I would agree with the premise. I mean, I can tell you that both um, Jamil Poverty Action Lab and Innovation Poverty Action have lots of lots of government collaborations, and they're very fruitful. They do cost more money. They're more involved. They take a large lead time, and they're at risk always of politics and the cycles and you know two years of of lobbying and advocating, and then all of a sudden you know the minister is no longer the minister and. Now you're dealing with a new minister and you have to start over. And so you, it, they're riskier and they're costlier. Um, but when they bear fruit, they're great. And there are lots of examples of the, of the you know, all the hundreds of randomized trials we put up that are government collaborations. Um, the country of Mexico actually was one of the first groups to do this. And they did it specifically to get over the politics. So they started a randomized trial of conditional cash transfers. This is before IPA and JPAL were started. Um, and they set one up and they did it specifically to overcome the politics. They said, we want a randomized trial so that if we lose power, we still have evidence that our idea here of conditional cash transfers are working. The evidence did come out in their favor. And we want it so that there's such a nice study, not done by a Mexican specifically, because they didn't want any accusation of internal bias for whatever it's worth. So they actually turned to people who swore they had never been to Mexico before. <laughs> for better or worse, I realize there's a trade-off there, but that's, that was, I'm just telling you what happened, you know? Um, and, and, and they did these studies. And the program was successful, did persist, but just got a new name for the new government, and they rebranded it. Right, um, and, and I found in the early days of IPA and JPAL, 
that all I had to do in other parts of Latin America when I talked to government is say, we want to do what the Mexicans did. And they go, oh, that's great, we want to do that too. And that was actually really successful for getting other governments in Latin America to sign on to do randomized trials. Um, we know that IPA has been one of the leading organizations in working with the governments. Is it realistic for smaller charities? Dixon, perhaps you could take that. Um, is it realistic for smaller charities to be ambitious in terms of working with the governments? Uh, I, think, I think so, yeah. Um, a lot depends on whether you are focusing on, on the government's priorities, you know. Um, but I think you know, most governments would like to test things out to see if they work. Uh, but as Dean mentioned, uh, trials, randomized trials, are costly things. And, and oftentimes, uh, the policymakers may not see the, um, um, the, the actual value of running a trial. Um, but once you get them to actually see what's, what, what is involved, often they do buy in. You, I, I'm glad you mentioned you know, the theory of change and all that, which, which we are increasingly beginning to use in, 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 in this research space, you know, where we bring on board stakeholders, particularly governments, to actually get that buy-in right from the beginning before you even start conceptualizing the trial. So you know, these, these kind of strategies often do get governments on board and they see the value of, of, of running a, a randomized trial before they actually uh, start, start a program to decide you know, which way they should go. Yeah. Thank you. We have a spicy question about the Oxfam scandal. Uh, how, from your experience, do scandals affect charity sector and your work, if at all? Well, maybe Tris, I think do you want to take I, that? I guess, yeah. um, so from the beginning of, uh, from the origins of NPC, we, we kind of had this issue where People really seem to trust charities on an ongoing basis to quite a high extent. Most surveys around the world have shown that. Um, and on the other side, we believe very strongly, and you know, we now have lots of evidence to show that this is the case, that there are amazing, amazingly effective charities, and there are mediocre organizations, and there are organizations that are doing harm. And that for us to kind of get our collective message across, people need to get that there's a difference between those, right? But actually, uh, often that kind of effectiveness and a lack of effectiveness isn't out there in the, in the public consciousness. So we had kind of expected to see, you would always expect to see scandals occur um, about many different issues, but then those to make donors more questioning and to drive you know, the collective kind of the field that we all operate in, those who are seeking out data. I wouldn't say that that seems to be the case um, you know, many scandals that there have been in, in the UK over recent years, journalists are certainly much more focused. They think they know there are stories here now and they're going after them again and again and again. But whether that's actually translating into donor behavior and being more thoughtful and uh, more investment in, in evidence is yet to be seen. Uh, and even the case of, so we work with the Ministry of Justice here in the UK to, um, to set up something called the Justice Data Lab which actually connects real government data with any charity program that works around prisoners and, uh, and offending. And any program can get a good uh, quasi-experimental -exper study to find out the results of their program and what would have happened in all likelihood anyway. And I mention it because from 150 studies that have been carried out, 20% of them appear to be doing harm. Like not even not creating an impact, but doing harm. That's a systemic scandal. <laughs> Or there's a program uh, that you can go and look into that was published on the Justice Data Lab site recently, a government program working with 20,000 people, no impact to a high degree of accuracy. 20,000 people, <coughs> control group of 700,000. Um, and yet that's not a scandal. There obviously are scandals out there. So it, it's a curious, curious phenomenon. Does anyone else have any experiences with this? No ideas. We, yeah, I mean, I you're, just heard you're, about it. I mean, for luckily, we, you know, our senior management are all women, so that helps. <laughs> <laughs> Always helps. We need more women on our board, but our senior management's all women. <laughs> um, our last so. question for the panel: um, Entrepreneurs traditionally aim for growth. Um, where bigger is better. Is it the same, and does it apply to charity? Annika, would you like to start? 
Yeah, I think it's a great question. I ask myself this all the time uh, because I think what we want to be careful as an organization um, about not doing is growing for growth's sake. So it's really important to us to maintain the caliber of our programs. That said, we've grown really rapidly, and, and I think that counters against a desire for scale. I mean, when you think about it, and you know, why is scale important? It means you're reaching more children. I, I, um, I have a five-year-old, and actually I was doing a lot of pneumonia scale up when he was around two years old, which is the most vulnerable age for pneumonia. And I used to think, my family's from India, I said, you know, if I were still in India, I, it would, I, I can't imagine going, you know, if, if we had scaled a program in pneumonia in Rajasthan and I was living in uh, Madhra Pradesh and, you know, I, I, I had a child who was sick in pneumonia and I was like, went to a clinic, they're like, well, Rajasthan, you could get treated, but, but your child who can't breathe, we can't treat, right? This fundamentally scale means you're reaching the children who need it or the families that need it. And so we are deeply passionate about scale and oftentimes to scale that involves growth. But it could be the, the scale doesn't have to be the organization, right? It could be, yes, it could right. be the thing that works. So, That's exactly right. you know, anyone who's had experience of a, a youth club around the UK and they may be called slightly different things around the world, but local people in the community setting up and, and running as volunteers often a center developing relationships with young people sometimes facing disadvantage are part of the community. If you said scale that, that's crazy. You know, they're in Walsall. It wouldn't work. If you said go and do this in Hull, they're not there. Um, but actually the features of what works really well and how to ensure there's quality, that's the thing that should be scaled and that's where we need the kind of community to practice. Thank you so much. It's been incredibly interesting. Um, I'm sure that we all have much for, uh, food for thought. Uh, we will now break uh, for a short coffee break and we will all be back at 11 to 20. Yes, thank you, Barry. Uh, thank you very much.